Some Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the it- big city. <laughs> Should we start? Sweating the small stuff. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Little, all right. Yeah, I got a little tongue twisted there. Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's fine. <laughs> How you been, man? I've been pretty good. How about yourself? Another week. Another week, you know? Another week, another dollar. Another dollar. <laughs> no, I've been uh, just working. Not, nothing too interesting on my end. I, yeah. saw, I saw you went to Dia Beacon. Yeah, I did go to Dia Beacon with uh, fellow designer McKay Nelson, his wife, Courtney. Happy birthday to Courtney. Um, and uh, my wife, Allison. It was uh, it was fun. Dia Beacon is a beautiful d- museum. Uh, yeah. It, I guess it's upstate New York. Yeah. Would you consider it upstate? Uh, I don't know. I think... I, people talk about upstate in New York City, but yeah. it's really like, it's more middle state or like if you consider new york city to be part of the state like well because it is part of the state but it's like if you consider that the bottom i feel like dia beacon is kind of like mm, lower middle the way i imagine upstate is anything outside of new york city let's go to a map (laughs) but i also think that true new yorkers would not consider like dia beacon upstate let's do let's do some geometry dia here. beacon is like i don't know what 50 miles up from new york city so it's not very far yeah you took a train ride there right so we got new york yeah we got new york city here we got dia beacon here and then we have the rest of new york state i'm actually eyeballing it right now it looks about more like 78 miles away but yeah <laughs> cartographer over here um uh, but yeah, Dia Beacon. So the story behind the museum is that it used to be a factory. Yeah, it's just that, it's so cool. Yeah, um, and uh, there were some really awesome exhibits there. Like the uh, is it Richard Serra? Yeah, yeah, he has permanent. his. Yeah, his. I I I also saw his installation at the Guggenheim and Bilbao when I was on my study abroad. Yeah. And, I, and maybe for those who aren't familiar with yeah. Sarah, he does the big, huge metal structures. Just, it's just out of sheet metal or yeah. I don't even know what you would call these. These are larger than sheet They're metal. Enormous. Um, but yeah, he has, he, he has work all across the world. Yeah. Um, it's pretty amazing because it really is a, like a true experience. Mm-hmm. I, you know, there were some pieces at uh at dia beacon you know there's a lot of contemporary artwork there and certain pieces where i'm like this artist was the most incredible politician i've like you know to get this work yes. in this museum <laughs> well with, because how are you gonna you have to literally build a museum around sarah's work well but I, what I was referring it, to were artists that I was like, why is this in a museum? You like mean the, it was... There's, there's some contemporary artwork that I'm just not on board with. The fluorescent and, tubes? No, the fluorescent tubes are fine. Who's the guy that does that? I always forget. I forget, but... Um, are you saying it was too provocative it or would, it was just no, it was, a box? It was too... No, the, the one piece that I saw, and I forget the name of the artist, and maybe that's for the best so that I don't <laughs> smear them, uh, but... It was basically just writing on the wall that said one pint of green paint splashed against a wall. And then we were all supposed to imagine that we had a pint of green paint and then splash it against the wall. And imagine. Imagine it. And mm-hmm. it's like, man, you are an amazing politician art. To, to be able to get this in there as art yeah yeah and it's all about just like the thought of what it is i mean it's true i mean art is more about a thought like an like it's almost like a well thought exercise nowadays than it even yes, is now actually a technical there's there's some technical artists but. yeah 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 but that's where i that's where i love richard Serra's work because it is such an experience right like it's it's not just like this uh, this sort of charade. Right. It's like these are these enormous, like, you know, iron structures right. that you walk through and it totally warps your perception yeah. of space. And the one at Dia Beacon is like little spirals. So you like yeah. spiral into the center of it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's I mean, pretty it's, amazing. What do you think? 18, 20 feet tall? 
maybe more. Yeah, it was it was insane, um, uh, but like really really cool. And yeah, there was some there, like there were a lot of there were a lot of really cool pieces in there. There were just a few where I was like, "Come on, really?" Like, sorry, we we have a we have a slight uh, leaking situation. Yeah we, actually, yeah, we actually before we started the episode, well, you know, this episode got a little rocky at the beginning. I didn't even know what I was supposed to say. Uh, there was a a rainstorm right now as we're recording, and uh, I just heard a drop. So there's, an, there's the <laughs> occasional like, leak. I was like, "What's going on here?" Yeah. yeah, there's a little bit of stuff leaking in the back, but uh, yeah, we are going to pursue on. We are going to carry on <laughs> as much as I can, <laughs> unless there's a flood eventually, and then we'll have to figure something out. Yeah, we will. This could be the lost episode. No, this this could be the episode. last time you hear our voices. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it was really cool, really great trip. Beacon, the town, is a really nice town. It's nice to get away. From the city, yeah. You know, if you're a designer in the city, this is something that I, I have did not do for the longest time when I was in New York was take train trips up, yeah. up the river, and it's just so beautiful do. and peaceful up there. Compare, obviously, compared to New York. I feel like I I have to get out in a bit. It's, it's I haven't been out of the city for like I don't know, a good six months maybe. I think it's I think it's a good trip for just for mental health mm-hmm. as as well. Definitely. Um, and then. If we're talking about New York State, <clears throat> there's another place that I'm going to this weekend, which oh, is Rochester. Right. Uh, let's zoom in. Of course, now when this airs, you'll have already been there. But yes, it should be exciting, right? Yeah, I'm I'm excited. So I'm going to be presenting at the Thought at Work conference. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on Friday, and then I am also going to be on the Lazy Sunday panel. What is that? I guess it's just like the end of the conference I panel. Think, I, you know, I, I talked last year. I don't know if they had that when I was there. Yeah, they just asked me. I feel like somebody dropped out. Okay, okay. <laughs> there were like five people dropped out. Oh they're no! Like, they're like, okay, can you be who all else five do panelists? We have? <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna get up there and do a speech or something. James? Yeah. No, I so but anyway, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Uh I am I've been really interested in the past year or two with with like the Rochester the whole the program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really interesting program especially with uh with things like the Meta Project where they're getting students experience with actually getting things made. Right. Um with different corporate or company sponsors. So I'm really excited to go up and, ch- and uh, check the school out. Yeah. So that'd yeah. be good. I'm excited yeah. for you, man. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, and then we have our promotional segment here. So if you'd like, we have pins for purchase. Mm, pins Little for minor purchase. detail pins. I also saw one of the people on Instagram that bought a pin was using it as a push pin. Oh, I did see that. So you don't necessarily have to put so it on your clothing. Like- Buy 10 of them. Yeah, you know, if you want to buy... If you want a full push pin set... <laughs> that would fund us. That would fund us pretty well. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, put it on your little inspiration cork board and have it there to pin stuff up with, so... Yeah. Um, also, you can find that on our website, minordetailspodcast.com. And then we also want to thank our partner, Let's Design Daily. They are a design Instagram uh, blog and account, and they post amazing work by amazing designers so check them out uh we do some cross promotion with them and they've been really helpful to us yeah um yeah all right we got some we got some design news this is this is the james's design news week oh man you know i didn't google announced their new stuff i didn't even know this was coming to be honest i never know when these things are coming i'm not that much of like a tech junkie i mean i feel like i always know when apple's coming but never any other yeah but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of now. Now that Apple has set the precedent, every every tech company is doing these kind of rollouts, and right. these kind of right. uh, you know presentations. Um, but I've been especially interested in Google since they came out with like the Pixel, like, right. all of that stuff, the HomePod stuff. You've I feel always been like, a little bit of a Google fan. I'm googly for Google. Um, I just feel like. They are like, you know, under the leadership of Ivy Ross, Mm -hmm. it feels like they are very much trying to create 
uh, tech with a human touch. It, they do have the very softest aesthetic out of all the big guys, in my opinion. Yeah, um, and I love it. I think that this is this is the correct approach to tech, in in my opinion. I feel like everybody else. I, I feel like Apple has even gotten just more into the spec game. Yeah. Than than Google. Um, I I just feel like you know Google is going for this. It's almost like the I would say almost like a Scandinavian type of. It's got a lot aesthetic. of curves to it. Yeah, we're we're getting into that very curvature type of design. Um, you know, in contrast to I bet I guess it was a couple episodes ago we talked about Microsoft's new products. Right. And Microsoft has a much more hard edged aesthetic design. Yeah. And Google's is, is pretty much opposite of that. Uh, but they had their new product release this year, yep. and I think maybe they released, I don't know, a handful, like five to ten products. Yeah. Ranging from, what was it? You had their Google Home, I don't know what they call it. Yeah, Google Home Google Pod, Home, right? Home Pod? Or Nest, Nest Mini. <laughs> they all got names, right? Yeah. And they got their whole Wi-Fi system, and they're all pretty, you know, pillowy shaped. Um, but I don't know, I think a couple things that caught my eye... Uh, was the well first let's start off with the the laptop yeah so they have the i guess it's called the pixel book pixel book go um it's really akin to the my old macbook right my 2009 white plastic unibody macbook it has yeah. you know a full rounded corner on it um but what i really enjoyed was the grip underneath Yes. It has a kind of a wavy texture underneath that helps you when you're carrying it around, which, you know, I mean, kind of in contrast to like Apple or any other other guys, like, you know, this n- notebook probably isn't the slimmest design out there. You oh, know, they... look at that. Have you <laughs> have you taken a look at that speaker grill? <laughs> We're looking at a speaker grill right now. It's a <laughs> pill-shaped speaker grill. Get out of here. It's a nice speaker grill. You can check it out. Um, um, but yeah, I'm trying to find a, a good close-up of that wavy texture right there. It's it's a really nice texture on the bottom, and I, I admire that. Um, yeah. So that, that, that stood out to me. I, do, I, I did get caught up. I actually watched the keynote. Yeah. And... They said, oh, yeah, we're releasing it in black, and then also we're not pink. I was like, wait, they're not going to do pink? <laughs> and I was like, but why would they say they're not going to do pink? Why would they just just say they're doing black? And then I had to look it up. Right. And I realized, oh, wait, they're making a color, and they're calling that color not pink. Yes. And it's almost like a, a coral color. <laughs> yeah. Which was, I feel like... I'm not a fan of that copywriting there. So it's like, I don't you walk know. Into the it's store, kinda... You walk into the store and you're like, Hey, I'm looking to get a new laptop. And you know, the, the Google employee is like, Oh, you know, what color? And you're like, Oh, not pink. And you're like, okay, we'll get you a black one. You know, <laughs> I, got, I don't think that really worked out quite. Yeah. Well. Nick is working on his material for uh, his open mic circuit. Yeah. He's going to be doing, he's going to be this warming up the crowds at all the tech minor details. Late night. It's going to be the minor details. Late night episode. Late night details. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, I think it kind of goes in with their sort of like lighthearted ethos about all of their product. It's like, you know the I'm, whole I'm like not hard, pink sky blue like, i'm giving them a hard time yeah they but. they do have this this like naming convention around their their products which i think is kind of funny right um but yeah i mean it was it was really interesting i one part that stood out to me was actually when they were talking about the game controller um and funny enough the guy who we were all kind of seeing all of this through he was kind of interviewing the designers and engineers Used to be my next door neighbor. <laughs> That's crazy, man. It's it's very crazy. He works at Google. Uh, I don't or think he... so. I think he has a, like an independent media company. Okay, so uh, he was kind of just Bar- doing the tour. Baratunde Thurston. I've only I only had those very awkward neighborly conversations with him in okay. the hallway. Okay, because in in New York, nobody knows how to talk to their neighbors. Right, because it's like we live right next to each other, but we really don't ever want to see each other. Exactly. Like I exactly. just want to pretend that you don't exist kind of thing such a new york thing to do yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of unfortunate because then you find out that oh that person was actually really cool (laughs) um but uh he went to the house of the designers that did the game controller and they were talking about um that was actually like what started it was this idea of a like 
a really nice knife handle mm. and like a bent. So like a bent knife handle right. into the shape of a game controller because they were saying that like, you know, you, you see like a really good knife versus a really cheap knife. Right. Cheap knives have this very like particular ergonomic grip that yeah, forces we, your hand into a certain position. Yeah, every, everyone's pretty familiar with like kind of the, the scalloped like finger holds. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that is not really good design it's it's kind of marketed as oh look at this it yeah. looks ergonomic it looks like it'll fit your hand perfectly right and they're right it'll fit one person's hand perfectly and yes. the other like ninety nine thousand it won't fit perfectly yeah and so <laughs> you know the idea is that if you get a really good knife there's no there's no orientation because you're often twisting and bending the knife right. into ways that Make Every it, chef has their own skill. Every yeah. chef has their own technique. Yeah, so you can you can control it at kind of any angle. Right. Um, which like it's it's an interesting story. I don't know how it translates to a controller because it <laughs> is such a particular orientation. It felt a little bit like they were just telling the story to tell the story. But I I enjoyed the kind of romanticism of for the sure. story for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's and it is like a very nice looking controller. I I want to I want to try it out. It feels like a controller that's not like, hey, you're a gamer. Like that's true. You know, um, I, I feel like again we talk about this frequently. Like Google does have that aesthetic that appeals to the widest audience possible, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. Uh, but and then there's the phone, which the Pixel. I, I yeah, the Pixel Four. So I think it is interesting with the Pixel Four. They have. On all of their phones, they have this, like, I, I think it's aluminum metal um, bezel bezel around it, yep. around the around the outsides. Right. Mm-hmm. It's a very it's a very striking look um, that you don't, like, I, you know. It's contrasting, right? Is very contrasting. So, so, you know, the Pixel phone has the black bezel and then it has a white back onto it. Or yeah. they have other colors, too. They do. They have, like, an orange that I think is limited edition. Is it called not orange? <laughs> <laughs> it call it's called uh, it's called Nick's hair. Um, I I will say I think well the nice thing about the Pixel Four is it doesn't have the notch. Yeah, they, they just they got rid of the notch. They, I mean, they accepted that hey, we're st- we still have some space, so it's not a full screen to phone ratio. It does have a little bit of a top bar to it. Yeah, but it's not notched out, which is nice. I do have a problem though with the bottom. Because mm-hmm. I don't know if you notice this, if you look at the screen, it actually has a, a very thin bottom bar too. Oh, and so it's not like you know the Apple iPhone; everything is you know an equal distance from the edge of the phone. Yeah, except for the notch. Where this one, it's like, oh yeah, we we got rid of the notch. We just put the top bar up there, and then it's like, yeah, but there's a tiny little bottom bar that yeah. it feels like. Oh wait. We were trying so hard, but they couldn't quite get it. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I've heard people. I've I've watched a few tech reviewers talk about it, and they've been calling it a chin. Oh, it's, um, it's a little tiny chin. Yeah. So yeah, one of the reasons that they they have that big top bar uh, area, the forehead. Whatever, oh, they're adding is, radar. They have radar in there, so that's that it's a military Soli, phone. Now. I think it's called Soli that technology. Um, and uh, yeah, it is radar. And so basically they have these gestures lined up that basically you can, if you have music playing, you can kind of swipe to the next song. Right. So you don't have to or, touch your phone. You can just kind of swipe above it or have gestures to it. Yeah. So I remember Google launching this technology as a development kit. I think it was through Google like many, many years ago. And now for the first time using it in one of their products. I mean, it's um, cool. It's cool to see something through like that. Yeah, I think this is the first time they're using it. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh but yeah, it's very I I don't know. I saw MKBHD um reviewing it and mm-hmm. saying it was not very consistent. It it seems it seems a little bit like hey, we tack something else on. Yeah. I'm curious to see how it'll be useful. Like maybe it is going to be useful. It's right. just time will tell. One of the things that they were saying, one of the things that he was saying that's nice about it is that your phone does detect your approach to the phone. So right. with Face ID, like your phone already kind of turns on. So right. the unlocking experience is a lot faster. The other thing that he was pointing out was that, you know, you have you have your 
your rounded rectangle, your rounded square on the back. For the cameras, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for the cameras. And unlike Apple, it's only two cameras. It's not three cameras. Right. They did not add the wide angle. They didn't add the wide angle, which does seem like a miss. They 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 tried to defend themselves in the talk. I don't know if you heard yeah, that. Yeah, I did hear they that. They were like, oh, you know what? We thought that telephoto is actually more important than wide angle. <laughs> And then they kept going. I was like, what? Yeah. I just had to throw it in there. Yeah. Guys, just do your own thing. Don't like start complaining about other people. Yeah. I don't know. That was, that was kind of a weird deflection. Yeah, for but sure. But I, I don't know. I am. Um, it's, it's you're, weird. I feel like you're slowly transitioning to a, It's weird to a because Google, Google is this big company, obviously, but for some reason the hardware feels like an underdog Yeah, and it feels like it almost feels like I'm rooting for a small studio. It it does. And then, well, the, the thing is, is like, I actually think the aesthetics of Google have really come a long way, mm -hmm. especially this last round. I feel like they've really hit it on the hit it on the nail. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I I think their services are their strong suit. I mean, we all use Google Docs, right. Gmail, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um. But I think way maybe one more product that I was kind of excited about. Um, was the Google earbuds? I don't oh know, yeah, Pixel buds. I don't know what they call them. Because um, we talked about the Microsoft wireless earbuds. Yeah, and I was excited that they were circular. And then I saw the Google ones, and they're a little bit more like pillow shaped, a little bit like bulbous yeah. circles. I mean, they're they're perfect circles, but they just had that curvature to them. Um, and I, you know, I I was watching the presentation, and I was like, oh, okay. I mean, these are cool, but I kind of prefer the the Microsoft ones. And then they showed how big they were. These things are tiny. They're like smaller than your your finger. Really? They look like James Bond type of headphones. I was like, whoa, these things are half the size of the Microsoft ones. And then I was actually impressed. So yeah. I, I don't know. They look they look cool. Um Yeah, I, I feel like I need to check them out. Yeah. I I did I did like the aesthetic of the last ear the last earbuds they put out i don't know oh, how those comfortable the ones? they were or they they were wireless but they had a wired yeah i think they the had earbuds. a connector right. wire um but i am i am interested to check these out they do kind of deviate from the form factor that we're seeing with like the airpods and other right. devices where you have you have your little what do you call that mushroom it's like a, cap? yeah it's like an in-ear in-ear yeah mushroom um but uh, how are we doing, Nick? How's Flood Watch 2019? Uh, there's a few drips, but it's okay. We're continuing. okay. All right, we're continuing on. We are. We are. <laughs> we are going forward <laughs> boldly into the unknown. I'm not, um, I'm not a big fan of the Google Pixel Buds case, though. It's a little too egg shaped for me. It's not. It's not egg shaped. <laughs> we were fighting about this. We today were fighting the, about this on the, on the Discord. The Discord. An egg shaped is a asymmetrical along the vertical axis, or like, or across the horizontal right, axis. Right. This is this is completely All right, symmetric. I will, I will say it looks more like an egg than any other thing on the market, any yeah. other case on the market. Yeah, I don't, I don't dislike it. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say about the Microsoft uh, earbuds yeah, that yeah. I didn't get to say last time mm -hmm. is, well, I mean, for one thing, when we're talking about the size of the Google earbuds versus the Microsoft earbuds is that the Microsoft ones have all of these touch controls. I don't know that right. the Google's the Google earbuds have any of those controls. And they might have tap, I don't know. Um but it is it is funny to me. I do think that the the Google ones, they look like you know people who have gauges in their ears oh yeah like they they widen their ears out Yo, it so the, looks, Micros the microsoft discs look like the gauge discs. yeah it looks like the gauge but stuck stuck into the ear hole like they just misplaced it yeah, yeah yeah uh but i i don't know i i actually think that the the microsoft ones are still kind of they're almost like the most fashion forward of all of the different earbud options yeah. but i digress we were talking about my my favorite google <laughs> i do think um yeah i think generally like it was a good launch like i think there was some products that really piqued my interest for once in design from a design standpoint so yeah i definitely applaud the google team oh yeah and one thing one other thing they they added a little uh the ability to hang your nest mini that was oh. like the big oh. update to the nest mini <laughs> Ooh, we can hang it on the wall now <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh but yeah i think i i am um, this is the company that has me the most excited about a hardware right now. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. 
we've we've kind of talked about this a little bit. Yeah, I know we I, have. I'm, we, I'm excited for the VR stuff. That's, I feel like, that's where I'm excited for like AR VR. Right. But, I feel like one of our earlier episodes was Google like, versus Apple. Yeah, Google versus Apple. Well, we'll have to do you know Google versus Apple at another point in time. Maybe. I feel like Google. How are they not the first ones to AR considering the Google Glass? I mean, everyone has projects that they're working on. Yeah. It's just who is going to get that first iPhone of you right. know, AR? Who is going to get that first, you know, glass? I don't know. Eyeglass, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, just look at all these plants. All right. <laughs> Come on. Uh, did you want to talk about a, another design news? Yes, I want to talk about another design all piece right, of design is, news. Again, this is James's design news segment. So we got Dyson. Coming up oh next. yeah, we have we have to have our you know, contentious also, Dyson debate. D- Dyson James is a fan of Dyson as well, so come on. How can you not respect a man who's not only, in my opinion, a brilliant designer, but also a brilliant entrepreneur? I listen, I, I don't like think that Dyson's terrible. I just I think they make really quality products. I think their products function great. And, you know, they have the fans, which I think are are nice aesthetics, but they're not like amazing. What? A- aesthetically. What? And then the vacuums what? though, aesthetically, I just, it's just too oh. much. I just can't handle all that engineering packed no. into a vacuum. And then the color choices, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Okay. Guys. Well, first of all, the color <laughs> is a cultural thing. So don't be like that. Right. Is, is, I, are, are British people like purple? Is that what it is? Purple the Brit- and orange? The British. Is that, is that what they're into? It, as far as I have, I have seen with uh, British design, they love their jewel tone. Oh, type right. Colors. Yes, because the queen likes her jewels or whatever. Well, Is that how it works. <laughs> yes, they exactly. I think we got to the bottom of it. Um, no, I think I think I love the Dyson aesthetic. I think like celebrating the insides, such an unexpected thing to do, especially when it first came out. And now it's like a luxury product. People love the Dyson vacuum. It's like, the Balenciaga shoes. That's fair. You know? It's a, it's akin to the Balenciaga. I, I just don't know if I want it in my house. You know? I love it. I also would never wear Balenciaga, so <laughs> maybe the, maybe it's just a, a taste thing. What was... There There was an architect or a particular piece of architecture that I think inspired the design of the Dyson. And it's like, it's this building that has kind of all the internal stuff. Oh, Pompidou? Is it the Pompidou? Maybe. it. That could be... That seems really... Um, Dyson-y. Right. Uh, P-O-M-P-I-D P- P- something. You gotta put an I in there, I think. There you go. Oh, Pompidou Center. Here we go. Let's let's take a look. This is a modern art museum in Paris. Yeah. And it has a bunch of pipes and like the escalators on the outside in a tunnel. It has a bunch of scaffolding, so it always looks like it's under construction, but it's actually the architecture of it. Yeah. So it's so, quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it perfectly falls in line with the prioritization at Dyson of the engineering and functionality. Right. And I I think it's a great aesthetic. I really enjoy it. Anyways, the sad news, news, the news is the sad news <laughs> is is that they have abandoned the electric car project. I didn't um, even know they were working on an electric car to be honest. Well, <laughs> yes, you did. Don't act dumb right now, Nick, just because you don't like the man. Um yeah, I mean, I I don't know all the the details of it. I think they're trying to, I believe, kind of license out the design to a manufacturer. Oh. Am I correct? In, in I think that, that well, th- they cited one of the problems is is was finding a buyer. Right. So yeah, so maybe it was a licensing type thing, but I was very excited about this because I thought that like if somebody was going to come along and offer an electric vehicle that was very different and and significantly optimized. It would be very different for sure. I don't know. <laughs> I, th- I mean, I don't think that they would apply the same aesthetic. I really, to... I really would be curious what the aesthetic would be. I'm sure it's definitely not. It does look like, like a vacuum look, for sure. But I'm sure it was quite interesting. Look at the Dyson like hair dryer, or yeah. look at the fans. They don't do the same thing as the vacuums. I, I agree. It's my only problem is the vacuums. I just feel like the vacuums are just too much. I, I I think the hair dryer and the, you the fans don't even are okay. like the like V what is it the V V eleven okay that the newer one looks a little bit better yes but I think it's I think it's gorgeous um yeah. um but I I'm sad that we won't see the results of this car at yeah. least not right now but I also feel like 
it's not over until it's over. And Dyson is the type of person. I mean, I've I've listened to I listened to a podcast with him, and it was basically like oh really? Which podcast was it? I forget. Okay, well, we'll, <laughs> I com- we'll link it. We'll link. It I in completely forget. But yeah. basically, it was like him talking about these different uh, products that he designed and how he eventually had to be the the business behind them how he eventually had to sell them himself that's interesting and i mean he did he's like he did a brilliant job of it where dyson is a household name now yeah i the thing with the car is is you know i i'm a big fan of tesla and elon musk has talked about this at some of his talks but it's it's not really about designing or building a car it's about how do you manufacture an electric right, vehicle? Because right. the manufacturing is, you know, a hundred times more complex than the actual car is. Right. Because now it's a car is essentially your phone. It just has four wheels on it, right? Yeah. It's a big phone. It's yeah. got a battery. It's got a computer and <laughs> some wheels. Um, hey guys, let's uh, let's hop in my big old phone and let's go to uh, <laughs> go downtown. Um. So yeah, I certainly trying to manufacture a car is quite a feat and i think yeah. all the manufacturers right now are trying to figure this this problem out right um so i don't know we'll see yeah we will see and i and i hope that someday we see the uh the results of of uh dyson's electric you know, car also i i think a lot of times we see these projects fail and we're like oh you know the car didn't work i mean apple was even working on a car at some point yeah and are ma- they still you know who knows i mean i don't think apple's gonna come out and be like oh we're canceling your I mean, project. that's gonna be a big old phone you know <laughs> that's true um but i think a lot of times you, we need to understand that these projects they might not ever make see the light of day yeah but there's going to be so much that is learned on the mechanical side right. and like the technology side that's going to be implemented into the vacuums or right. or the iphone or yeah. i mean i even think about like spacex being implemented into tesla and yeah it's it all that stuff crosses over yeah so it's not all of a loss i think it is it is kind of a lesson for younger designers or just anybody who is fearful of taking a risk on yeah. something mm-hmm. um trying something out trying something new you're going to come out of it with something right like there's not i i don't i don't see really a case in which you won't come out of a difficult project with either learnings or something that you can apply to a different project or exactly. you know just your career in general who knows what doors it might open up for sure for sure so yeah um and i think that that kind of like segues somewhat into our topic which is we're talking about flow yeah i thought this one would be an interesting topic to touch on today i think um it's something I've been thinking about a little bit, just the idea that sometimes we feel like we're in the zone and sometimes we just can't get in the zone. Yeah. And I don't know if, um, I don't know. I, I just wanted to express some of my thoughts on this because, um, I would say a couple months ago, well, th- this year I feel like there was a couple months where I just was like out of it. Yeah. Like there was there was one month this year where I actually I think if we rewind a bit um I think my New Year's if we, I, I we should go back and listen to our New Year's episode, but I'm pretty sure my New Year's episode was to focus. Oh. I was like I'm going to focus this year. Right. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to pick one thing and just like go really deep. And mm. I did for maybe 4 or 5 months. Yeah. And I worked really hard. And then midsummer I just hit a hit a wall. Wait, so what was that thing? Was that on the bottle opener? No, I think a lot of it was client work. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I pushed the bottle opener through. I, it was, okay, maybe there was multiple things, but it was really like pushing hard for this past, right. you know, six months. And then midsummer, I hit the wall. And like, I think even if you look back at some of the episodes, I was like sick for like a, a good bit. Yeah. And then I like, it, it was, it was a whole, whole ordeal. And then I came out of that thinking like, whoa. Maybe it's not about like pushing yourself. Maybe it's more about like riding the wave. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I've I've been like kind of just going with the flow more. Like if if I'm not necessarily feeling it today or or that week, maybe you know I'll do more like managerial tasks and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's interesting because I was just recently we were just meeting with a financial advisor. Oh, and, you, and your, you and Allison, your yeah. wife. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was interesting because we were talking about retirement age, and I was kind of like, <laughs> "That's I, an interesting thing for designers." And I was like, "I don't, I just don't n- see myself fully retiring." You're never gonna flip off. It's no, it's ingrained in you. And so to think about things in that way. And this idea of like a push, because sometimes you're like, you know, you know, when that, when, you know, when, when everything is, when you're feeling the energy, you should just like push yourself, like, you know, mark out this time, push yourself to do something. But maybe it is, maybe it is better and wiser to do the just kind of like slowly chipping away at sort of a larger picture. Because if I'm thinking about, designing into my 70s or 80s like i've got some time right you don't want to burn out you want to peak at at you know 40 and then no you're done yeah Wasted. so so it is it is interesting to think about it in those kind of terms because i don't think that i really did until that conversation i was like oh wow like i'm not just gonna shut off at 65 it's yeah. probably it's probably gonna go past that and like maybe that's not I'm going to continue my career, but I'm going to be doing something. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's it's not like you were going to... You may, you might not be, like, working every day, or you might be retired, like, quote-unquote retired. But, right. you know, you're in the shop tinkering on, like, small things or, like... Oh, I'll never be in the shop. <laughs> you're not going to be a shop boy? I'll be, I'll be in the virtual shop. Oh, yeah, we're going to be in VR. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah, that's that's a very good point. I, I also think there's this push especially nowadays to really like hustle hard, right? The whole hustle culture is there and and you got to push yourself to the limits. Hustle and flow. I I think it's, it's a yin and yang. Like I think definitely there's some value in pushing yourself to the limits, Mm -hmm. but I think, you know, putting the throttle down full speed for six months is maybe not the best idea Mm. and can actually like be detrimental to your health. Right. Well, I remember when I was at quirky, uh or actually this was this is right after i left quirky was they sort of instantiated this thing where it was like okay there are four quarters in a year this idea of like four sales quarters like this is how sales sees the year right Mm -hmm. is broken up into these pieces right so the idea was like every quarter it would build up to a push and at the end of the quarter everybody in the company got a week off so it was like this idea of a deliberate push and a deliberate time off. That's interesting. Everyone got a week off. That's four weeks a year. Yeah. That's a lot of vacation. Yeah. Plus, I assume holidays too? Uh, I'm, or was holidays kind of lumped into the I quarter think, system? I think so. I, I don't I don't know because I wasn't, I wasn't working there at the time. Hmm. But it was, I did think of it as a very interesting model of like, huh, like, yes, you know, there's a time for pushing and there's a time for resting. Yeah, I think I think that model is kind of underrated too. I I think we're in this age of like nine to five grind all the time. Right. And it might be better to do more of the the like hunter gatherer style, like, hey, go out, kill the big lion, like work really hard, and then you're good for a bit. Right. I mean that's I feel like that's more the freelance lifestyle. It's yeah, you know, feast or famine kind of thing. Um, and hopefully you don't famine. Hopefully you have <laughs> stockpiled up some, you know, lion I'm starving, lion meat. Nick. Or not lion meat, buffalo meat. Let's not kill lions. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I I just think that I wanted to talk about this a little bit just because I also have the, the contrary. Like, I want to say maybe last month or so, I was just doing a lot of projects, working on, like, the stool project, doing some things, posting them to the Instagram. Um, I was really in the zone. And... The f- weird part is, is that I had multiple people message me and they're like, Nick, what are you doing? Like, like, not like, what are you doing? You're crazy. Well, the usual people say that, but <laughs> they were like, I feel like whatever you're doing right now is, is working. I don't know what it is. Are you like doing something? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I'm just, I, I did say like, I, f- I do feel like I'm in the zone. Yeah. But other than that, I'm not doing anything different. Right. And then I was like thinking about it, like, wait. Like maybe it's not really about what I'm doing. Maybe it's just like a time thing. Right. Maybe it's just, it happens and 
you just need to capitalize on it. Like you just need yeah. to appreciate it. Yeah. And then there's the counter thing where it's like, oh, maybe this month I'm not, I'm not really in the zone. Maybe I'm not like hitting the nail every time. Right. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that especially, you know, obviously with uh, between freelance and Instagram, there's different parts of our life in which we can be in a flow right you know or or even outside of that in relationships or friendships or whatever there's like there's different aspects where you can be like flowing yeah and sometimes sometimes you might have to prioritize one thing over another or, and you or get... sometimes all of them just crash <laughs> right they're all of them right at the bottom but that's like that's like i honestly like sadistically sometimes like i remember uh, you know, like when I first moved to New York or like a couple of years in, I was like, if, if I came home and somebody had stolen all of my stuff, it would be the most like relieving thing <laughs> I could ever imagine. Cause you get to start over. Yeah. You get to start over. Like there's no part of a video game that I love better than like starting the video game and building your character. Right. That's true. You know? So like this idea of like crashing to rock bottom, it's like, God, like the, I, I think sometimes crashing to rock bottom, like you can get, you can get these little wins right? and you can feel like, oh man, I'm making progress more than you could if you're at the top, more than you could if you're at the top or even if you're middling, like you can feel like nothing is ever like nothing's ever good enough. Like nothing is propelling me to track. Like Mm. you just don't see I mean, right now I'm in the middle of like Inktober. Yeah. Which Are you is, feeling the flow right now or no? I feel the flow occasionally. Like I would say like I fell behind a little bit and I was I was sort of like scrambling to catch up and now I'm caught up. But it was it was this like scary feeling of like like I felt like I was starting out strong. I felt like the flow, whatever was there. But especially like Instagram can really get to your head about like whether you're in the flow or not. Yeah. And, and it's I think that contributes to it a lot. And and I had to remind myself that like, you know, with my helicopter project, I wasn't necessarily getting a lot of attention while I was doing it. Yeah, but you still felt like it was good. Like you were I, in the flow still. I was enjoying it. Yeah. And that I think that's what the key point is. Too. Yeah. And so at the but like by the end i was like okay i have all these things like what has that done for me but it was such an enjoyable process and later on things have happened with that project that have opened up doors or for for collaboration or whatever and it's like oh i just didn't see it and i think that that's one thing that can get in the way of like a solid flow is that idea of like, what is this all for? Yeah. That's the, that's a, that's a good point because there is this idea that there's like a goal or like there's an outcome. There's this thing that you're trying to strive for. Yeah. But I think that almost counteracts the flow. It's like, you're trying to like steer it. Yeah. I feel like what I've experienced and especially like this year is like, just let it go. Like, right. Like you see that, you know, you see that big goal up in front of you. And you start steering away and you're like, wait, 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 but just wait, just calm down for a second. Yeah. Because wait, it's steering you another way. There's another thing. There's another goal (laughs) that you didn't even see. You're like, whoa, this person wants to collaborate or Hey, this client reached out. Whoa, this company just messaged me. Like, yeah, I didn't even expect this. I was just trying to license my helicopter toys, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like good things that can come out if you just embrace it. I don't right. know, that, that's what I've been kind of thinking about. It's just like, instead of trying to like steer the sh- ship, just enjoy the moment that you're in. And like, maybe you will have some downs. Maybe, maybe you'll be up. I always, I, there's this, um, I don't, I don't know where I heard this. I think I was heard it when I was a kid or something, but it's like, uh, it's like, Hey, if you're in a slump, don't worry because eventually things have to go up, right? Like you're at the base level, right. you got to go up. If you're at the top, better worry. <laughs> Things are about to go down. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, totally. Uh, no, it's it's totally true. I I I think that that's like a great summation of 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 these like peaks and valleys. I mean, that's that's what they are. 
and you can feel a lot of pressure when you're in a valley to get back to the peak and you can feel a lot of pressure when you're at the peak to keep out of the valley right but like but i think you should just accept it right like, i don't think that it's hard it's hard it, to accept. oh it's hard for sure i believe it it's yeah, yeah. absolutely hard to accept and that's where i think like exercise meditation anything that you can do to sort of like keep yourself even or like to focus to like find find something to focus on outside of your work to improve upon or like just little things that you can do to like pick back up your momentum or yeah no know. i i agree i also i think there's another part of this that conversation i also wanted to touch on maybe yeah. more of a shorter topic idea but like thinking about flow in terms of more the the actual like work sense like hourly sense more mm. of a, a like you know you're working on a project day to day kind of stuff yeah where for whatever reason you get into this zone and you kind of zone out for like an hour right and before you know it you've done like a 2 hours worth of work yeah and you didn't even think about it yeah um i mean those are the moments we all strive for yeah and it's hard to grab that moment in this like hyper distracted world right i think it can be helpful because i know that for me if i don't have kind of an idea of what i'm going to work on tomorrow it will give me stress mm. and it will make it harder for me to get into a flow state so are you, do you have any tricks or like do you plan out your days the night before i know that's a big trick i try to just have like one one thing that i'm trying to accomplish and like i have i also like have tried like recently been trying to set out like there's just general things in my life checklists that I need for like the week of things to accomplish, like outside of my work, like laundry. Right yeah. Now. But then, <laughs> but then when it comes to work itself, it's better for me to have an idea of what I'm going to be working on tomorrow than to go into it without any idea of what I'm going to be working on. Um, that's a good idea. And that's, I mean, that's something from, from Jocko Willink. Uh, you know, he's a podcaster, former Navy SEAL, but he talks about like having your checklist done the night before, yeah. of, like what you're going to do the next day. Cause I do find that it's very hard to like build that checklist up in the morning. Yeah. I, I haven't done the checklist thing, but I definitely can see how it can be helpful. Yeah. I have my to-do list, but that's not a checklist. <laughs> that's just like that... a perpetual rock on my shoulder that I always <laughs> have to carry around. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that would stress me out. Um, I don't know. I've been thinking about getting into some of the more to-do apps or whatever, like digitize. Like my list is literally like a whiteboard list, right? right? Um, I also, one tip that I've been, that's helped me is setting a timer. Mm. And specifically, if you remember, the weight weight that oh, I made, yeah. my big concrete timer. Yeah. Um, I put it on top of my phone and then I set it to an hour. Right. And th I think there's something about a physical timer right. that helps me. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, it's sitting on my phone. So if I have to actually check my phone, I have to exert physical force. Yeah. And it's not like something, e like it's, you know, I don't know, 15 pounds maybe. Yeah. Um, so it's a literal force that you have to f f pick up to check your phone. Yeah, you do a kettlebell toss. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, but the thing about the physical timer, and I don't know if this will help anyone else, but it has that very like quiet, like tick to it. It's like, <laughs> are you sure you're not going slightly <laughs> mad? I'm going crazy. <laughs> um, I think it's a little bit, uh, like, I don't know, meditative in a way. Yeah. It has that kind of monotonous, you know, tick and, uh, you know, sometimes I work without music and I just hear that in the background and it, it you know, it just reminds you like, Hey, you're time's passing and you kind of need to get stuff done yeah um that's cool i also used to use i don't i haven't used this app in, in a while but it's called forest mm. it's the forest app and it's the same kind of idea where you start a timer and then once the timer finishes you grow a little like tree it's like a it's a game right like so you grow a tree and then you know if you use it over and over again you grow multiple trees yeah and you have a forest yeah and then it's also great because you can every tree you grow or it's like every 10 trees you grow you actually plant a tree yeah in the real world it's huh. like connected with like the tree association I don't know. oh cool check it out um there's there's another there's another technique which i think there's like these productivity productivity journals 
mm. that uh I think my sister-in-law gave me one of them for Christmas, but the idea is like you set out your list of things to do and their thing is 25 minutes of work, five minutes of break. Mm. Like they break it up that way. Interesting. I don't know if that's, you know, if that's conducive for design work. I mean, I think, but yeah, I think everyone has a different kind of way to approach it. Yeah. But, I, th- uh, I, I do think there should be breaks though. I think breaks are also helpful just to yeah. kind of rejog your memory. For sure. But uh, I don't know. I I think um, should we move on to some questions? Yeah, yeah. Have, it, we, have we wrapped up the flow? I think so. I think have we flowed out. Yeah, I mean, like my thought was just like, hey, I think a lot of times we struggle to get in the flow, and I think my feeling has been in the past couple of months, like just embrace it. Mm. And in other words, go with the flow. <laughs> oh no! I gotta put I gotta put my James oh, jokes in there. Oh no! <laughs> We got to cut that out i think i'm kidding um Ho- yeah hopefully the <laughs> ceiling doesn't flow down i, w- I don't want to go with that flow it's i think it's stopped dripping a little i bit. think it's I, we're good for uh, the moment um but yeah let us know what you guys think about how you get in the flow um join the discord we have a bunch of designers chatting on there about all kinds of stuff all day long yeah um, so it's awesome to to chat with them for sure. And then if you have a question about design, send it to minor details podcast at gmail.com. We also have a voicemail, 1646-494-4011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can leave a voicemail if you want your voice to be heard on the podcast, which is really fun. Uh, but yeah, we had a few questions this week, so we wanted to, to answer them. Um, and our first question comes from Cass Moore, and they ask... What do you think about the difference between pragmatic slash utilitarian design and design more for aesthetic reasons? For example, 3D printed connections for modular furniture, which is not beautiful in a classic sense, compared to more clean, minimalistic chair designs. Mm. I mean, that's definitely two sides of design right there. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like this this kind of gets into a topic that I'm very curious about, which is just beauty and aesthetics, and like ornamentation versus minimalism in a way. Yeah, or or you know, functionalism. Right. You know, there's there's part of me that feels like designers designers often talk about this idea of like including the customer into the design process. And, and sometimes I feel like customers don't want to be included in the design process. <laughs> they just want their, they just want a thing. They just want like a completed, beautiful thing. That's true. That's true. And, and so like, I, I mean, I kind of understand like a bit about like customization, mm. like fitting a space. I mean, that's where you hire somebody like a carpenter, right. somebody to do custom furniture for a particular space, like whether it's like, you know, a custom TV cabinet or something to fit a certain space. Yeah. But then you're telling that person to consider all those details so that when they show up, it's, it is a finished product. That's it. That's kind of interesting. Cause yeah, when you do something that's more of a customizable object or that like, uh, cast had like 3d printed connections for modular furniture, like you are putting all the weight of design or some of the weight of the design on the customer. Right. And yeah, maybe some people enjoy the the DIY aspect of that. Yeah. But other people, you're right. They just, they want, they paid money. They want the thing done. They don't really care about like, oh, maybe it should be, you know, a three piece sectional couch. Right. Instead of a two piece sectional couch. Right. Yeah. And I think like, you know, there, there's obviously companies like Ikea and, and other companies out there where they're, they're concerned with the flat pack you and you have all of this sort of like build it up. Yeah. Tiny kind of thing. I think there's different, definitely a different, uh, value to that though. Like yeah. there's more shipping and cost savings in that sense, but there are the, the products that are more customizable. I mean, I think about like even like the shoe companies like Nike plus and stuff like that. Yeah. I wonder how often that stuff is used compared to just traditional. Right. I just think that pragmatic utilitarian design just caters to a very specific market, which is often like people who maybe don't have a lot of money. You know, they're, they're like, 
they're they're finding these things it's like you know using cinder blocks to mm. like prop up a plywood board to be a table the old bachelor pad yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like i i feel like it caters to a very very specific market but i think eventually people people want and this is like my opinion and maybe like i'm i'm interested to to do more research about this yeah um but i feel like eventually like what makes people feel at home is being surrounded by things that are considered that are resolved that's because, true like w- why do we want why would we want to live amongst things that are somewhat kind of like unresolved like the feeling of non-completion like the place yeah. i i feel like you find comfort when you feel like like i uh, I, 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 I understand know. what you're saying i think you're right like if you walked into your room and you saw you know your cinder block you know coffee table yeah it functions great yeah and even it does have a particular aesthetic to it like it has that very industrial aesthetic right but i think your subconscious it's a subconscious thing yes has that unresolved feeling it's not it's not conscious it's like oh yeah it's fine like whatever yeah but no that's an interesting question for sure thank you Cass. yeah i don't know exactly how to answer that one but i don't know good, good thoughts for sure you want to read this one uh yes the next question is from richard siggy Yes. Um, and they ask, I'm an industrial designer design student from the UK and I'm about to start my final year of university where I'll be tasked with designing a product that solves a problem of my choosing. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now and figured you'd be a good authority on how best to approach an open brief as the prospect of total creative freedom is something I find pretty daunting and you should find it daunting. It, yeah, <laughs> this one's a tough one. Well, it's not a tough one, but I definitely know that we all know the feeling of the brief that's like, hey, design a product. Right. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. I mean, it usually happens at school. I, in the real world, you don't get this, I, I would say, almost never. Um, although I do think our MakerBot challenge was pretty wide open. Yeah. Um, there, are, like, On occasion, you'll get a brief that's like, design almost anything. Right. And it's like, Oh, you, you freeze up. Yeah. You don't even know what to do. Yeah. Everything. How do you design anything and everything? Right. Because design is essentially a funnel and a brief is just like telling you the size of the funnel. Yeah. yeah. And it's like you say design anything you want and that that funnel it's is not just, a funnel anymore. It's, no. It's a pancake. I don't even yeah. know what it is. I don't know. It gets so big that the earth is flat like that's that's what happens right the earth is flat james <laughs> so i mean I, yeah i the way that i eventually approached my thesis was and my thesis was only a semester but i was like what am i just like really interested in exploring right and that was pretty much it was like I want to mark out some things that I'm interested in exploring. One of those was form. I was really interested in form, in studying form, in sort of developing my form giving abilities. And the other thing was like, I was always interested in toys and kind of education. And so this idea of like, I eventually arrived at this idea of redesigning the school desk. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like, my whole my whole thesis because a lot of times with like the thesis you're applying for jobs while you're doing the thesis and yeah. so like you don't even finish the thesis to show to anybody to right. get hired exactly and so it's like do exactly what you want and follow your curiosities and they will lead you to interesting places in yeah. my opinion i think that's a good piece of advice i would say i had the same approach like my my thesis was furniture as well it was furniture for the whole family not just adults or not just kids um and yeah i just did it because i had this idea of like a pillow fort couch yeah you know cushions that could fit together and i was like this would be really cool to design yeah and you're right like it is your senior project and i honestly think that a lot of seniors have a little bit of senioritis and i i kind of feel like your thesis project isn't the most strong project Mm -hmm. like you're probably you're probably on the way out and you're probably like 
kind of kicking it back. And you're right. Like, ah, maybe I'll just like wrap it up and call it a day. Yeah. Um, and you're right. You have already sent out all your applications. Um, I don't want to, I mean, I think you should always strive to do amazing work. Sure. I think another uh, route you could take is give yourself some uh, applied constraints. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe you, instead of thinking about a topic that you're interested in, in think about a material or right a process right because when someone gives you a wide open brief you have to give yourself constraints right like that's the only way you're going to be able to move through this this quote you know designer's block yeah so maybe you're interested in like bending metal or yeah. hydro forming or you know some interesting you know new sustainable sustainable process i don't yeah. know yeah yeah, I think for those for the reason that you were saying, like, you know, this the senioritis thing, people not putting as much time into it. I think that's exactly why you need to make it a project that's easy to be interested in, is because like you can get into that flow, right? Like almost immediately because you're like, I really like this topic. Like, there's there's no struggle for me to get interested in this topic. It's exactly what I want to be doing. Yeah, um, I would agree. I don't. I don't think anybody should be doing a thesis project for anything other than to like satisfy curiosities that maybe have been bubbling in the back of your mind right. your entire time in school. I think there the other one aspect that might be uh, contrary to that is doing a thesis project that kind of fills in a gap in your portfolio. Mm. So say you yeah. have say you have a bunch of automotive work. You are like automotive driven. You want to go into the automotive industry. Um, and your thesis project, you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm not going to make it. Maybe I should do a consumer product. Yeah. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Like maybe you're right. Maybe you should just focus on cars. Like if that's your passion, go for it. But I don't know. Maybe you should do just that other project that could lead to something else. I don't know. Yeah. That, maybe that throws a wrench in the whole whole advice. But right, something to think about for sure. And and one one more idea. Yeah. What's your other, Say other idea? Say there's a some a certain special someone in your studio that you have had your eye on <laughs> since the first year, and you're like, if I don't try to make this move now, I never will. And so. <laughs> You design a project a, a re- that a is box or something. You design a project that is entirely around them <laughs> and solving a problem for them. <laughs> and in the process, you will fall in love. Yes. And find find the the love of your life. Find the love of your life. So, <laughs> with that, Richard, I hope that helps, Richard. <laughs> yes. Um, we want to shout out, do a little shout out of the week. Let's do a little shout out of the week, shall we? We wanted to shout out Craig Hill this week. Craig um, Hill. I believe it's Craig Hill, right? Or is it yeah. Craig Hill Company, at Craig Hill Company on Instagram. Yep. Um, they're a New York-based company, and they make a bunch of accessories and houseware objects um, that are really beautiful. And, you know, it's all out of, like, machined uh, metal. You got a lot of brass. They've yeah. done, like, you know... Uh, puzzle toys and ball openers and things like that. Um, but we want to shout it out because they just launched a new Kickstarter. It's crazy. So they just launched this Kickstarter for... Um, it's the Tyco puzzle. It's like a cube. It has a bunch of pieces. I guess it fits... It all comes apart and fits back together. I Yeah, it's crazy to me. I am so intrigued as to how this comes together. Um, but yeah, it forms this really soft this nice soft cube and you know i i saw the launch and i was like oh that's cool they started a kickstarter and yesterday i think was their first day okay yeah and went to kickstarter and they already had passed their goal oh man their goal was ten thousand. okay and i i feel like it was yesterday or the day before that they were at like thirteen thousand. now they're at ninety five thousand dollars and that's as of recording by the time you guys watch this who knows it's it's crazy but i mean congratulations to them like this is awesome like they're you know they are a smaller company yeah they do these nice unique objects 
And it's, it's great to see like when companies like this that are putting time and effort into unique items are successful. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's got, it's, I believe it's brass and metal on there. I mean, brass and stainless. Yeah. It has kind of this, uh, yin yang feel around it, um, between the two finishes. Yeah. It's really cool. Check them out, uh, at Craig Hill company. And then obviously we'll link the, the Tyco puzzle Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, so you can check that out as well. For sure. All but right. Yeah, give us a give us a five star on iTunes. Come on. Or not iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Google Google Podcasts. Come on. YouTube. Oh, congrats, James. We reached a thousand. We hit one K <laughs> subscribers on YouTube. Which means we can now put ads on our videos. We can now gain <laughs> point five cents. <laughs> For on, every end? for every thousand views, oh. I don't know. Oh. It's oh no. Yeah, buy I, a pin. I was about to say like 0.5 cents for every buy ad. Buy a pin. It's like three dollars an episode or something. Uh, we'll we'll have to see, but it is exciting, and I thank every one of you who has subscribed to the YouTube channel. It means a lot to us. The support. Yeah, I was joking. I don't I don't know. We haven't discussed any YouTube ads yet, but uh, make sure you subscribe if you aren't already. Do it. Uh, and then we got Spotify. I guess you can follow oh, there. Oh, yeah. And our intro and outro is by the awesome Kiyoshi the Kid. Mm-hmm. And as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at Eyedrawn Receipts. Peace out. Later.